Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology. In this video I'm going through everything you need to know for topic 10 infectious disease for Cambridge International A Level. So get yourself comfy, get a pen and paper ready to make notes or even make your own flashcards because this is all the information that you need from the spec. And if you want to skip that step and get a set of notes that has key marking points and special examiner's tips then click the link below and you can get your copy there. But for now let's get into infectious disease. Topic 10, we're going to be looking at infectious disease, looking at infectious diseases first and then antibiotics. So within the infectious diseases topic, you need to know that bacteria, viruses, protoctista and fungi are able to cause these infectious diseases. But you actually focus on these three in particular for your exam board. So pathogens can cause harm through directly damaging tissue or through the release of toxins. And the three particular diseases you need to know caused by these pathogens are tuberculosis and cholera, the bacteria, HIV, which can develop into AIDS, and then malaria as a protoctista disease. So we're gonna go through each of these, starting with the bacterial diseases and tuberculosis. So this is caused by two different strains, Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium bovis. It can infect humans, deer, cows, pigs, badgers, and it causes harm, the bacteria causes harm, by damaging the lung tissue and suppressing the immune system. It can be cured though using antibiotics because it's caused by bacteria, and it can be prevented in the first place if you have a vaccine so you develop artificial immunity to it. So let's have a look at it in a bit more detail. Tuberculosis spreads mainly through the air when infected individuals cough, sneeze or speak, releasing the mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria in tiny droplets. Transmission usually requires close and prolonged contact, particularly in crowded or poorly ventilated settings. And factors like having a weakened immune system increases your risk of developing the symptoms and therefore you're able to transmit the disease as well. So TB, tuberculosis, can also remain latent in the body without causing symptoms. Next then, the Mycobacterium bovis, which is the other strain, this is the one that is found in animals such as cats and badgers, and it poses a risk to humans through direct contact or consumption of contaminated food. Now control measures include testing, vaccination, and other biosecurity practices um, such as trying to prevent the spread through having more space. And this is crucial to prevent that spread among animals and reduce human infection. So a bit more on the prevention and control. So biological factors then, the mycotuberculosis bacteria is primarily transmitted, as we said, through air droplets. And understanding that TB transmission can help then to reduce the risk factors and infection because you can do simple things such as coughing into your hands, washing your hands. You could also do quarantining people who are infected. If we have a look at social factors, social economic factors such as poverty, overcrowding, malnutrition, because that lowers or weakens your immune system, and limited access to healthcare, so maybe you aren't vaccinated, could contribute to the transmission. So TB control efforts should address social factors as well so trying to alleviate poverty maybe providing vaccines for free improving living conditions and that should help prevent and control the transmission of tb next on the economic factors you need to have adequate funding of tb control programs so for example diagnosis treatment with the antibiotics and preventing with the vaccines are all essential to try and reduce the incidence of people getting the disease and dying from it. So strengthening healthcare systems, including laboratory infrastructure, the ability to diagnose, all of these will be crucial to help prevent and control TB. The next bacterial disease is cholera, and this is caused by Vibrio cholerae, and it's highly contagious pathogen that thrives in contaminated water and food sources. It spreads primarily through the consumption of contaminated water or food, particularly in areas where there's poor sanitation and hygiene. It infects the small intestines, where it produces toxins that leads to severe diarrhea and vomiting. And without treatment, cholera can rapidly lead to dehydration and even death, 
making it a significant public health concern, especially in regions lacking access to clean water and proper sanitation facilities. So there are efforts to prevent cholera outbreaks, and this often focuses on improving sanitation, promoting hygiene practices, and providing access to safe drinking water. And this slide here just goes through a bit more detail on those, broken down into biological, social, and economic factors. So one way that's helped to prevent and control the transmission was understanding the biology of it, because now we know that it's transmitted through contaminated food and water, and that it's a bacteria, we know that you have to make sure you're drinking water that has been completely cleaned and food is thoroughly cooked and you can treat it with antibiotics. Social factors as well, knowing that drinking or having access to clean water is essential, improving hygiene practices such as washing hands can also have a huge, huge role in trying to prevent these spreads, as well as education and having communities aware of how it is transmitted. Lastly, then we've got the economic factors. So again, it's linked into the idea of poverty, poor infrastructure. Um, if you can improve all of those, it's going to help reduce the spread and contraction of cholera. Next time we have a look at viruses and viruses are non-living, they're acellular, which we talked about in earlier topics and videos. They're smaller than bacteria and they just consist of genetic material, which could be DNA or RNA, a capsid and an attachment protein. The viral replication happens inside of host cells and the virus has to inject its nucleic acid into the cell of the host to be able to replicate. And bacteriophage are actually an example of viruses that infect bacteria. Now the key example that you need to know is the virus HIV and it consists of the following structural features. A capsid, which we can see here as these blue, the dark blue circles, and that is an outer protein coat surrounding the genetic material. That is what is in the core, which is the genetic material, which is RNA for HIV. And the enzyme reverse transcriptase is also within that, which is needed for the viral replication. There is an envelope layer, which is an extra outer layer made out of lipids, which have been taken from the host's cell membrane. And then we have the protein attachments. And these are on the exterior of the envelope to enable the virus to attach to the host's helper T cells. So if we have a look then at how HIV is transported and how infection occurs, it's transported in the blood and it attaches to CD4 proteins, which are these receptors on the outside of helper T cells, which are part of the immune response. The HIV protein capsule can then fuse with the helper T cell membrane and that enables the RNA and the reverse transcriptase that were within that capsid to enter and it's entering the host cell. The HIV enzyme reverse transcriptase which has been entered along with that RNA into the host cell are then copied into DNA and that DNA copy can move into the nucleus of the helper T cell. And once it is in the nucleus of the helper T cell, that host's DNA as well as the viral DNA will be transcribed, translated, and so the viral proteins are going to be made along with the other proteins that would typically be made in the helper T cell. And in that way, it can then reassemble all of those proteins and a new viral particle has been created. So someone is described as HIV positive when they're infected with HIV, but it's only described as AIDS when the replicating HIV viruses in the helper T cells have interfered with the normal function of the immune system. So if I just go into a bit more detail on this, the point above here where we talked about how HIV replicates inside of the host cell, once all of those viral proteins have been assimilated to make a new virus particle, when you have enough new virus particles in that helper T cell, the helper T cell gets destroyed. And if you have lots of helper T cells being destroyed, that then means that your immune system is compromised and it won't function normally. And that is when someone has AIDS. So with the helper T cells being destroyed, that means you are unable to have this immune response and defend yourself against other infections and even cancer. And that's why HIV, when it's destroyed enough helper T cells to result in AIDS can cause death. So the HIV itself doesn't cause death, 
But when you've developed AIDS, because the helper T cells have been destroyed, you can then die from other infections because you can't defend yourself. So here then we have prevention and control methods for HIV. So first of all, it was understanding HIV. So we know now that it's transmitted through sexual contact, blood to blood contact. So for example, sharing needles and perinatal transmission. So that means through the placenta from mother to child. And understanding this means that we can then put in place preventative me methods to try and stop that transmission. So for example, having barrier methods as contraception, so condoms, for example, blood to blood contacts and not sharing dirty needles as well. Social factors, and we've got stigma, discrimination, social marginalization of key populations, including it has been in the past sex workers, men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, has happened. Um, but it's best to actually think about these biological factors of how you can protect people without having this discrimination. Um, economic factors as well. So again, poverty always plays a role that links to the lack of education that people might have of how they can protect themselves, but also it might link to lack of access to drugs. So antiretroviral therapies or ART, which an infected mother can take while they're pregnant to prevent it being transmitted to their child. Then we look at the protoctisters. So the protoctista or protist are eukaryotes. They're single celled organisms or cells grouped into colonies. Very few are actually pathogenic, but the few that are, are incredibly dangerous. So the pathogen protoctistas are parasites and are usually transmitted through a vector. So we're gonna be looking at malaria, which is transmitted by mosquitoes. So this is the example you need to know, malaria. And it's caused by the protoctista plasmodium and it's spread to humans through the vectors mosquitoes. Plasmodium reproduce both sexually and asexually within mosquitoes and within the human host. So it's passed from mosquitoes to humans when mosquitoes bite and take blood from humans. In humans, the plasmodium infects the red blood cells, the liver and the brain. There are some preventative medicines, but no vaccine and no cure. And we can see here a range of the different symptoms that this plasmodium causes once it's infected a human. So how it can be prevented and controlled? The main way it's prevented is through preventing the vectors, which are the mosquitoes. So having that understanding of the life cycle enabled us to realize that the transmission through the vectors could be a key way to prevent humans getting infected. So this again links to social factors, economic factors. To prevent that transmission, you can have medicines in advance, like anti-malarial drugs to try and prevent you getting the disease. But having things like insecticide treatments to kill those um, vectors, the mosquitoes, or having bug spray to try and prevent yourself being bitten, having mosquito nets to prevent them being able to get to you when you're asleep at night in countries that have lots of mosquitoes as well. Next, we go on to antibiotics. So an antibiotic is a substance produced by a microorganism and it inhibits the growth of other microorganisms. Since the discovery of penicillin, which was the first antibiotic discovered in the mid 20th century, antibiotics have been used widely to treat bacterial infections and save many lives. So the way that antibiotics kill bacteria, because they do only kill bacteria, are by preventing cell wall synthesis, and this could be that it inhibits the enzymes responsible for making molecules in the cell walls and the bacteria then die from the leakage of the contents or lice from too much water entering. Or it could be through disrupting cell membranes. So it could be that it binds to the phospholipids in the bacterial cell membrane to distort the structure and it makes the membrane too permeable so it bursts and therefore the bacteria would die. And the final way is they can interfere with protein synthesis. So it can attach onto bacterial ribosomes, which prevents the protein synthesis. And therefore, if the bacteria doesn't have the proteins it requires, it will end up dying. So antibiotics only work against bacteria and not viruses because viruses don't have cell walls. So those mechanisms that we just described of how that antibiotic can kill bacteria wouldn't work. And unlike bacteria, viruses lack cellular machinery for metabolism, growth, or reproduction. And again, that's why it doesn't affect them. 
Since viruses lack those metabolic pathways, that is why the antibiotics won't cause the destruction of them, as well as the fact that viruses are within the host cell themselves. So you'd have to destroy the host cell as well as the virus to be able to treat them. Now, antibiotics is not a perfect medicine because antibiotic resistance has developed in bacteria. And this has happened through random mutations that happen in the DNA of bacteria. And by chance, a mutation would have occurred, which results in the production of a new protein that provides a selective advantage, meaning it creates some protein, which now means that antibiotic cannot kill that particular bacteria. And as a result, that bacteria will survive, reproduce, pass on that mutated version of the gene, which creates a protein that enables them to survive, until eventually you have this widespread population that all have the antibiotic resistant gene. Now, this was really sped up by the widespread use and misuse of antibiotics because the antibiotic was the selection pressure in this example of natural selection. And the more you were taking the antibiotics, the more that meant the non-resistant bacteria died, the resistant ones survived, and then they had no competition. So then they could really thrive. Um, so they weren't competing for resources, water, and that's why the non-resistant ones were able to thrive inside of the host. And as a result, you had even more reproduction and passing on of that resistant gene. So that resistant bacteria reproduces rapidly until you have an entire strain of bacteria that are now resistant to that antibiotic. Now, the two most common resistant bacterial strains are Clostridium difficile and MRSA. Now, MRSA is actually a strain of bacteria resistant to multiple antibiotics because once this process happened once, another random mutation happened in one of those bacteria and this whole process happened again and again and again until you had this strain of bacteria resistant to multiple antibiotics. So the consequence of antibiotic resistance and prevention then, antibiotic resistance poses a significant consequence for public health and healthcare systems and economies worldwide. Resistant infections are harder to treat because you don't have the antibiotics to kill the bacteria. And that can lead to increased illness, deaths and healthcare costs. Limited treatment options exacerbate the problem as healthcare providers may resort to broad spectrum antibiotic use. And that further increases the resistance because you're now adding an even more or adding another selection pressure. Moreover, the antibiotic resistance also under undermines infection control efforts increases the risk of outbreaks and compromises the effectiveness of medical procedures like surgery and chemotherapy. So to reduce the impact of antibiotic resistance, you have different things that are occurring. So for example, doctors are now less inclined to prescribe antibiotics unless you really, really need them. So maybe you have a weakened immune system, so your immune system won't be able to fight the pathogen by itself. There's lots of awareness campaigns as well to educate people on the importance of not taking antibiotics unless they've been prescribed, not taking them for viral infections because they'll have no effect, and making sure you take the entire course of antibiotics that you have been prescribed to take as well. So that takes us to the end of topic 10. If you have found this helpful, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of the future videos.